Welcome everybody once again. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us today. As you can see on my screen, uh, we're talking about go get that job. This was the, the most fitting name that we, you know, we wanted for today's webinar because, um, yeah, it, uh, it really spells out what today's discussion is, uh, is all about. So I've got some introductions. I'll firstly introduce uh, myself. So my name is Paul Lewis. I'm the Managing Director for Pittman Training. I'll be your host today. And at Pittman Training, I really get a buzz out of helping people to get the skills they need to go and get the jobs that they really want. So um, yeah, this is, this is a subject very, very close to my, to my heart. So hope you enjoy today's webinar. I'm just going to take you through the, uh, the structure and then, then I'll introduce our, our guest speaker for today. So the webinar, this is how it will run. We'll be with you for about 45, maybe 50 minutes. Um, we would ask if you could stay with us right till the very end because we've got some uh, exciting updates towards the end of the webinar for you and lots of um, opportunities to interact as well. Um, pretty difficult to interact with uh, hundreds and hundreds of people, so you, you'll appreciate we can't take you off camera or take you off mute, but please do use the chat function to say hello to us and say hello to each other as well, maybe get some uh, discussions going there. Um, also, we've got some live polls. We're, we're sort of, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're running as many polls as we can today to try and hear from you and get your say on some of the things that we're talking about. So please do take part in the, uh, in the live polls. Um, and then the, the third way of interacting with us is send us your questions. So I just want to go over this, um, you know, one last time. The chat function, uh, we won't necessarily monitor it all the way through. Um, so that's your opportunity just to sort of uh, have a bit of fun and talk to everyone on the webinar. But the Q&A function is, is for your questions for um, either Lee, when we, when we start talking to Lee, uh, questions for myself or Pittman Training. Um, so if you put your questions into that Q&A feature, we will hoover them up um, towards the end and we'll try and answer as many as we can. So um, stick around towards the end, to see if your question indeed gets answered. Um, we will be recording. We are already recording the webinar, so you're welcome to get a copy of that. Or if one of your friends or something, colleagues, wasn't able to make it today, you could always share the recording with them. And then on to our objectives very briefly. Um, we want to cover as many areas of the whole recruitment process, recruitment journey as we can. So barriers to getting hired, we'd love to talk around that one. Um, how to stand out from the crowd, maybe easier said than done. So we'll be talking about that for sure. Career change as well. I guess we all kind of come at this from different angles. Some people um, are not employed at the moment and would love to get employed. So that's one place. And then, of course, you've got people who want a promotion or want to move up the ladder. And then almost this third one is what about if you're in a job, but you've you're not enjoying it anymore and you really want to break out of that. So we'll be talking quite a bit about career change, um, skills and qualifications to help you on your way how to find the jobs and apply for them. That's a, a kind of skill in itself. Um, CV, we talk a lot about CV when, when we're looking into job opportunities. Confidence as well. It's not all about the qualifications and hard skills. It's about the soft skills and, and, and your self-confidence. Interview techniques and uh, ultimately getting hired. So that's the structure. Hopefully that set things up nicely for our discussion. So I do now want to introduce our special guest. So um, you may well recognize Lee. So he was the winner of the um, Series 4 Apprentice a few years ago, successfully hired by Lord Sugar. Um, he's also the founder of uh, two very successful um, talent and recruitment companies. You'll hear more about that. The Raw Talent, uh, Raw talent Academy, a very different type of uh, recruitment company. And more recently, Phoenix 51, which um, is a very powerful uh, technology platform, which enables companies to use um, very clever technology to, um, to recruit their people based on competencies and based on behaviors. So, you know, that's really exciting. Um, Lee has a real passion. You'll see that in a moment for helping people, for helping organizations to recruit talent and helping people to find their dream jobs. Um, and aside from all of that stuff, Lee's a very passionate Tottenham fan, as you might be able to tell from the shirt over his uh, left shoulder there. Um, and he's married and has three young daughters. So welcome, Lee. It's our pleasure to have you on the uh, webinar today. 
Thank you, Paul. And thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. And yeah, I mean, what a fantastic introduction. You've done most of my, my job for me there, Paul, uh, to, to be fair. Um, I, I suppose just a little bit of background around the two businesses and, and my journey. I mean, my journey in recruitment spans just over 20 years now. Uh, which pains me to say that, but it is, uh, uh, you know, sh showing me age. Um, but I have got over 20 years experience in recruitment. Um, I, I had a very strong career, uh, a long career actually at Capita, uh, one of the largest business process outsourcing businesses in the UK, um, before the apprentice came calling, as you said, um, and I decided to challenge myself. And I suppose that's probably one of the, the, the thir first things that I want to say today is that I, I believe that you only ever learn when you jump outside your comfort zone and you never learn when you're inside your comfort zone. And, and actually for some of us today um, on the an amazing uh, audience that we've got here today, some of us, it is about confidence. This is about jumping outside your comfort zone, doing something slightly different in order to be able to get hired. And I'm a firm believer and that's where you learn. That's where you grow. That's where you become better. So I decided to, um, to go on the apprentice, um, actually via an application form. Somebody put it on my desk one day. I, I didn't apply per se on that way. Um, and I thought, why not? So I applied. I beat 20,000 candidates, got to the top 16, beat 15 other candidates and ended up winning. So um, wow. I must have done something right. Um, you know, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of bumps, humps and bumps in, in, in anybody's journey. And my apprentice journey wasn't any different. Uh, my, uh, my entrepreneurial journey hasn't been any different over the last 10 years. Um, I started Raw Talent 10 years ago this month. So it's 10th birthday this year. Um, and uh, like, like you touched on, Paul, you know, Raw Talent wanted to challenge the market, do something different. Everybody gets recruited on a CV. The CV is the go-to thing in order to get through the door. And I wanted to change that. And I wanted to say, look, you know, let's rip up the CV and let's hire based on personality, behaviors, and competencies. Let's hire based on who I am or who you are, Paul, or who, who, who the audience are. Who actually are you? And can you get that across on a piece of paper? Um, is it about qualifications, just about qualifications? Is it just about the work experiences? You know, my, my experience in perm recruitment over 20 years says it isn't. It is about what can we bring to that organization? So that was the premise of what War Talent was, the foundation that War Talent was built on. And if I'm honest, I fused that apprentice experience with my recruitment experience, and that's where War Talent was born. And about seven years into the business, after we'd taken the, the, the company global, um, we decided to develop a, a technology platform in, in that business that digitalized the people assessment process to really understand the behaviors, the competencies, the values of what organizations are looking for in people. So um, last year in 2020, which I'm sure everybody will agree has been, you know, a, a nightmare of a year for, for, for most people with, with the whole global pandemic we decided to step outside our comfort zone be brave and launch phoenix 51 as a standalone SaaS business and the technology business that that paul paul mentioned um and it's going fantastically well because we have captured a moment in time where organizations are looking for to, to make better hiring decisions better people decisions and individuals like yourselves are looking to get into them them companies not just on the basis of the rat race, which is there's 50,000 CVs that are out there. Am I going to get to the top of the pile? But actually, based on what can you deliver for us? What can you bring to our organization? How can you be different to, to, to the rest of the applicants? And that's exactly what our platform showcases. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Lee. Um, and uh, yeah, if you don't mind, we'll be tapping into your experience as much as we as much as we can today. Um, so before we get into the, uh, I guess, the, the, the real agenda, um, I have to ask the uh, the question that I'm sure is on many people's minds. Um, how how was that whole apprentice experience? And was Lord wow. Sugar really was Lord Sugar really as scary as he uh, comes across on TV? Wow, look at them pictures, Paul. That's amazing. <laughs> I've got no grey hair there. Um, <laughs> amazing stuff. Um, it, I don't often get to talk about this anymore, so I love the fact that you've asked me, uh, and I'm hope hopefully the audience will be interested as well because um, it was a long time ago. Um, but when you put yourself out there, you're you're expected to be under scrutiny, um, and there's no you know there's no bigger place to put yourself out there from a business perspective than on the biggest business show that's in the UK, right? Um, series four, uh, it was the second season on BBC One. I think we grow something like 11 million viewers uh, each week, or certainly in the final uh, for for my particular series. And it was tough. It was really tough. You know what what people don't see just watching it. If you're fans of The Apprentice, you'll know the concept. 
if you haven't seen it before, the concept is every week you're put through business style challenges to see whether or not you can handle pressure, if you can lead, if you're a team player, if you can sell, if you've got the right commercial acumen, if you like. So all of the key competencies and Lord Sugar and his advisors are watching, looking, observing and seeing whether or not you're the best person to go through to the, to the next week and so on and so forth. Um, so it was an incredible experience. It was incredibly tough. What a lot of people don't realize is that it's, it's on weekly for 12 weeks, but we actually film it over a six and a half week period which essentially means that we didn't get a day off in six and a half weeks, which I'm not complaining about. It's, you know, it's a good hard working lesson, but it means that you're constantly on the go. And that the best way to describe it is that for those of you who watch, you know when the phone rings in the morning and then Sir Alan asks you to be somewhere or Lord Sugar asks you to be somewhere in 30 minutes, that's actually real. So you're, you're going to sleep every night kind of with one eye open because you're not sure, are we going to get a day off? Are we going to have to do a task? What time's the phone going to ring? So there's always something on your mind. So you're working on low energy, um, essentially. You're working uh, kind of off, off the cuff to, to a certain degree and with people that you've never met before. And you have to work together as a team, but then also one of them gets fired. So you're almost trying to turf them out as well. Does that make sense? So it's, it's, quite, an, it's quite a unique experience. So to go through that and do the stuff that we did, it was, it was fantastic. And then to work for Lord Sugar, he was, he was amazing. Uh, still in contact with him every day, uh, not every day. Like I don't talk to him every day, but on a uh, on a on a um, contractual basis, we we, uh, we talk. Um, so we we left on good terms. I think the key thing is with Lord Sugar is he wants to build entrepreneurs for the for the for the country. Um, and yes, I worked for him, but actually I became an entrepreneur off the back of my apprentice experience. And I, I think that that's that makes him uh, you know that makes him happy. So he's firm but fair, and and I like that in a boss. You know, and like to know where I stand. And I learned a lot, you know, of how to start a business. Again, you talked in, in your uh, prelude, uh, Paul, about confidence. I had, I had confidence, not confidence issues, but I had something around my confidence to say, I wanted to start my business for, for probably 10 years previous to when I did, but I didn't have the courage. I didn't have the confidence to go out and start. I didn't have the, the tools in my kit bag. Does that make sense to be able to go out and do it? The apprentice gave me them tools. Lord Sugar gave me them tools. I learned a lot, worked with his son, Simon, set up an Amscreen business that went pan-European um, relatively quickly. It's a very, very good business still going today. So it was an amazing experience and something that I can honestly say, if I hadn't have done that, I probably wouldn't have started the two companies that I now that I now own. Yeah, fantastic. Well, uh, thank you for sharing that as well. Um, yeah, we certainly did dig into the archives to find that that picture there. So sorry about that one. Um, <laughs> no, that's no, good. Before we we're about to dive into one of our first polls, which I'm excited to uh, to get everyone's feedback on. And uh, before we do that, in case anyone has just joined us, um, so welcome. Firstly, um, in terms of how the webinar runs, if you want to say hello on the chat, feel free to do that. If you have a question for Lee, we've set aside some time at the end, towards the end of this uh, webinar today, and uh, myself and Lee will try and scoop up as many of those questions. We are looking for the best ones, by the way. So you know try and uh, you know try and think outside the box in terms of the question that you want to put in front of Lee okay so um, we will move on to the first poll um, now this is uh, it's quite a big question uh, we've got um, some options for you it's, it will pop up on the screen in just a moment so what do you think is the most challenging part of securing a new job so hopefully whether you're on your phone or your laptop you'll see on the screen is it creating a compelling CV that gets noticed? Is it having the right skills and qualifications for that role? Finding the jobs and applying for the jobs? Gaining an interview for the job? Or being confident and successful in the interview? So if you want to cast your votes, what do you believe is the most challenging part of securing a new job? I think it's just the one option. So you, you pick the one that really jumps out. Um, Lee, before good everyone... There, isn't there? There's some good options there, Paul, to be fair. Yeah, well, we... we think that covered most of it but from your point of view lee before the results come in this will be interesting oh this will be a what, test yeah look what from all of you you've placed hundreds and hundreds of people right and helped yeah. them to get jobs what, what what's been the you know the biggest hurdle that they've had to uh, you know kind of get their head around well, since, since we started War Talent 10 years ago, we probably circa around 175,000 candidates through our process. Um, so, you know, pro probably more than that. And, and I would say time and time again, that the key one that comes up is the, you know, getting noticed, 
how, how do I stand up from the crowd? How can I get a compelling CV? You mm-hmm. know, and, and, and that's the, that's the one for me that I would be um, I would probably suggest would be the highest one in our poll. Okay. I, I think in terms of uh, being confident and successful, I think that comes with ironically practice i mean it sounds a bit weird isn't it you don't want to practice loads of interviews because you kind of want to go for one and get the job and you know your job search is finished but 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 actually going and practicing or whether or not it's with family members sounds a bit weird but whether or not it's doing role plays i'm a firm believer in practicing getting it right making sure that you're almost rehearsing so you can actually make sure that you've got that that down to a t but I think authenticity is really important. And I think it's, you know, it's about being yourself. It's about being you. And it's about making sure that you're the individual that comes across, not what's written on a bit of paper, not what has been, you know, acting. You know, mm-hmm. I, we, have a, we have a saying with all of our clients is that we're not, we're not hiring actors or actresses. We're hiring you. So, you know, we want to see the very essence of who you are, where your background is, what, what is your makeup? What, why are you the person that you are? What are your values and your beliefs? I think that's really, really important, Paul, and be mm-hmm. interesting to see how that's influenced or not the poll results. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, look, um, so if we can have a look at the results then, if you look on your screens, they should pop up. Well, here we go. So I think by a whisker, it's being confident and successful in the interview. Um, yeah. And then, you know, very closely followed by, you know, getting a, a good CV that gets gets you noticed. Um, so kind of talks to what you were you were just saying there lee yeah um, it, it's, it's an interesting one as well like you say just pip to the post but they're the two key ones that i picked out i think the reason for finding and applying for jobs is so low when unemployment certainly in the uk right now and probably globally is so high is that you know there's a raft of ways of finding and applying for jobs online uh, for all the major job boards you know indeed mm-hmm. or linkedin or whatever it might be yeah um, I think that the, the, the key hurdle is, okay, I can find the application. That looks quite nice. Now what do I do? And that's that creating a compelling CV or that being confident and successful in the interview. I've always, so my, I suppose, top tip, if you like, without sounding patronizing or whatever, would be certainly on, on, the, on the being confident is I've always found if you know your subject matter, then you should be confident about it. So, so in other words, Paul, you asked me today to talk a little bit about my background and, and what I'm all about. I'm confident about it because this is my subject. This is what I know. So I don't need to research my background, do I? Because I know it. Whereas, whereas actually, if you'd have asked me to come and talk about uh, rocket science today um, or quadratic equations, I would be very, very much outside my comfort zone and have to research the subject very, very, uh, you know, uh, very hard in order, to, in order to make sure that I was knowledgeable about it. Does that make sense? So yeah. my, my, my viewpoint uh, going on to the compelling CV part as well is understanding... Why are you applying for that particular role with that particular company? So it might be a career change, as you mentioned before, or it might be for first time that you're, you're applying for a role. But why? Is it because you need a job? Because that's very different to needing a career. That's, that's a very different in, in your own mind. Isn't it? There's no right or wrong here, by the way, but it's, 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 a different, it's a different outcome. And actually, if you're looking for a career, you want to be with a business for a longer period of time. Have you got the right values and culture and beliefs within the company that match yours and, and again one of the reasons why we built our platform Phoenix 51 as we have is because values and culture is 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 much more telling than than what the skill element is once you've got the skill element you can train it and your development through the likes of Pittman training but actually if you're going into an organization that has completely different beliefs to you or different values to you it, it, it kind of doesn't match together. Does that make sense? So therefore, yeah, yeah. you know, it's not just about um, the, you know, the compelling CV. It's about understanding what that, that company is. And you can only do that through research. And if you're doing your research and you understand what that company is about, that means you become more confident because you know that you're a good match. Does that, does that make sense? So all of that together yeah. fits, fits in. And therefore, when you come to writing or compiling a compelling CV or resume or video as it's probably uh probably going to be m- moving forward then ultimately you've got the key points that you can you can highlight in that process whether or not it's on on a piece of paper in terms of cv or whether or not it's in an interview uh, uh, mm-hmm. on a video so so the, the key things are, uh, are all make one and i always used to say to uh, to all of my staff and i still say it now actually look, knowledge is power and it's not just about that that uh, that that education knowledge 
it's also about that research knowledge. Why are you applying for that role? Is this the right role for you? You know, finding and applying for jobs is only got 5%. That's because there's so many jobs there, you can just press a button, apply, 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 apply. And then what happens, it has an adverse effect. If somebody say, right, okay, Paul, how many jobs have you applied for this week? You go 25. Have you heard anything back? No. So you're ultimately demotivated because all you've done is you apply for 25 jobs, you press a few buttons and you're demotivated by that process. But actually, if you can actually look at, go on to LinkedIn, go onto their websites, understand actually what are their core values? What are their, um, what is their culture like? Is it the same as what I want? Then all of a sudden you're matching yourself Good to advice. not only that, the, the, the actual role, but the company values. And I think yeah. that's really important. It then get, lends you to be more um, interested in the role, which means that you'll do more research naturally, which means you'll be norm, more knowledgeable and therefore be more confident when you mm-hmm. do uh, um, eventually get that interview in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah, to- totally agree. I think great advice around, you know, looking into the culture and maybe doing going beyond just click for the application like the other 100 or 200 applicants, you know, what, what else can you do? I, I think you made some great points there. So sure. um, we'll, we'll jump on. Thank you, everybody who took part in that poll, by the way. Um, we've got uh, another few for you because we really want this to be a kind of um, two way two way discussion all the way through. Um, just before we uh, put the next poll on the on the screen here, Lee, um, finding a job and, 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 and getting hired is, is challenging enough, right? Um, I think we'd all agree on that. But um, has, it, has it changed? Has it, got, has it got harder in the last 12 months, you know, with, uh, with the pandemic? Has it, has it changed the game completely? What, what, what would you say? I think it's changed, for sure. Um, I think that, I know probably a lot of people are going to hate me for saying this, but, you know, video is, is, is absolutely coming to its own. We're, right. we're now on a webinar with you know hundreds of uh, people, and again, thank you for all, for all joining. But that's uh, that's the power of video. You know, the power mm-hmm. of video to be able to do virtual interviews, uh, to be able to do virtual assessments or people assessments, like like Phoenix Fifty One can do. The ability to be able to send in a video of about who I am and what I do and what my personality is to that potential organisation is 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 stronger than ever, more ever before because of COVID. I think uh, um, uh, the pandemic has has created. Um, a, 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 an opportunity of, of such uh, to, to some industries, but obviously decimated most other industries. I mean, you can only, you only have to look at the travel industry, for example, hospitality, yeah. very, very different. So if your skills lie in, you know, I don't know, uh, restaurant management or, you know, front house or, you know, uh, running a bar or whatever it might be, that, that, that industry at the moment is, is going through a very, very difficult period. So, yeah. you know, is it an opportunity um, to reset, press the reset button in, in your own career and say, do you know what? been thinking about changing anyway now this has happened let's press the reset let's go recheck retrain and let's mm-hmm. let's let's go after something different but again for, for me it comes back to the same thing about your own values and your own beliefs you know yes there's always a monetary value there Paul of course there is because we've all got mortgages and families and we've got you know we have to earn a living but there's also a, a line of which you, you you know you can almost draw kind of pros and cons and to actually say if I if I continue in what I'm doing where's that going to take me and if mm-hmm. I if I start to retrain and change where's that going to take me and am I, and am I going to be happier for it so I think that there's I'm always a glass half full type person so forgive me if you know if, if you don't like that approach but I always think there's an opportunity I'm, I'm a firm believer in things happen for a reason and mm-hmm. actually you know the raw talent business that we talked about before 90 percent of the revenue fell off a cliff in march 2020 wow. um you know and i don't mind sharing you that's 90 percent of our revenue now we I, I could have you know stuck my head in my porridge cried and said look game over we're, we're gone but we didn't what we said was right let's consolidate let's do something different let's use this as an opportunity to reset but in fact i, lo- I launched a new business as, as we know phoenix 51 so it's, a, it's an opportunity rather than a, a negative. But yeah. you have to say that everybody's been affected in a, in a negative way at some stage during the pandemic. And yep. you know, that's, that, that's something that's probably brought the, not only the country, but the world together because we are going through similar situations across the planet. Yeah, no, totally, totally agree. And I'm, I'm with you, you know, kind of half empty um, is or half, half full, should I say glass half full is the only way, isn't it really? Because um, hiding under the duvet. Um, yeah, doesn't doesn't tend to well, get me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Tottenham fan, as you mentioned earlier. So I can't be <laughs> I can't be if I'm pessimistic, you know, that's that's sending me over the edge. So you yeah. have to be positive being a Tottenham fan. 
<laughs> but what I, well, look, you know, me too. So I know how that feels. But um, what I would, uh, what I would say as well, from from what you've just been discussing there, Lee, is is video. You've you've said it a couple of times now, and it, you know, absolutely, I think it's, it's one of the crazy. things that we're going to keep on coming back to. So we want to bring the audience um, on board again now. So. Um, uh, this is our next poll. It's going to pop up on the screen in a moment. Slightly, it is related to the first question, um, but this kind of assumes that maybe you're starting to get noticed. You, you know, you've maybe um, even got an interview. Um, but what becomes the biggest barrier to getting hired at that point? Is it because you don't have the skills that they are looking for? Is it because you don't have the work experience that that employer might be looking for? Is it confidence again? Is it employer's prejudice? And sorry if that's a little bit sort of left field, but you know, maybe maybe that needs talking about as well. You know, maybe you're too young, too old for the job that they're offering. Okay, um, uh, or is it because volume? Is there just too many people going for the same job? So if you want to cast your votes now, Lee, I mean, you know, don't know uh, what, what your kind of um, thought is on this particular question. I think confidence will come into it for sure, um, as we talked about the first one. Um, so I think there'll be a lot of people um, that will that will vote that. I, I personally, I think a lack of skills is um, is it won't be that high, and and the reason for that is that we can train for skill. Like right? that, there's no there's no there's no excuse from an employer to say, oh, you haven't got the right skills because ultimately we can train for skills. So if yeah. you've got the right attitude, right behaviours, the right values, we can train for skill. I appreciate that does um, uh, come into seniority. So depending if you're, if, it, if you're going into a kind of a, an entry level or retrainable role, uh, you know, to maybe a senior or director role or leadership role. Um, prejudice is an interesting one because, you know, I'd pro probably call that bias and that unconscious bias. And I think there's a lot of unconscious bias um, in all of us, um, you know, and it's, and it's something that has been probably over the last five years, maybe certainly over the last three years has been, brought to the top um, so people are yeah. starting to recognize it a little bit more and understand what it means and, and what that looks like and my business partner is a occupational psychologist um, and a, a qualified business psychologist and you know we, we go into a lot of detail about that unconscious bias because the mm. whole whole theme of it is it's unconscious you don't mean to do it it's not mm -hmm. something that you are meaning to do but but actually you, you end up hiring in, in your own image so, yeah. so, you know, if you're, if you're a white male, for example, you typically end up hiring a white yeah. male in, the, in that image or, or that's your default button. If you're trying to make a decision and you're not quite sure, you default mm -hmm. to what you've always done before. And if yeah. you've always hired white males, then guess what? You're probably going to default to that button. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, absolutely. So, it does. So, so again, wrapping some science around the decision making and actually saying, let's not worry about um, looking at what university you went to or um, looking at what your background is or whatever. Mm -hmm. let's, let's look at you and the skills that you can bring, the personality behaviors you can bring to the organization. It starts to channel or wipe away that unconscious bias and you're actually scoring and looking against them key behaviors and competencies that you need in your business rather mm -hmm. than based on that individual in front of you. Does that make sense? So yeah, it starts absolutely. to take away that kind of unconscious bias. There's a lot of work yeah being done by some amazing companies globally to, to, mm -hmm. to try and eradicate. I think the only way you're going to eradicate unconscious bias is if it's a fully fledged AI solution. So mm -hmm. I, the computer makes the decision. Yeah. Um, and again, I've got some views on that as well, which I'm sure we'll get into, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, going down that route is, uh, is, uh, is a bit scary as well. Okay. Well, look, um, hold that thought. We're going to uh, put the results on the screen and just see how it, how it comes out. I'm, I'm really interested. Okay, again, it's really, really tight, but lack of work experience. Okay, that's um, that's our number one, followed by too many applicants um, going for the same jobs. And then everything else is is uh, a bit lower. Confidence is there at number three. Um, yeah. Lee, any, any surprises for you there? Um, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think a lack of work experience is is the feedback that that maybe the audience are getting when they apply for a role. Okay. Sorry, yeah, you've been able to be a rest of yeah, so you've been unsuccessful, Paul, because of a lack of work experience. Okay. And if I'm honest, having been in the industry for 20 years, I think that's a little bit of a, I think that's a little bit of a get out. Uh, yeah, get you out think the employers really. are just I mean, kind of taking the easy option, right? Yeah, because because what that does, if that's the feedback that you're all getting, what that does is it doesn't really tell you anything. It doesn't give you any understanding of how to improve. It doesn't give you any understanding of uh, you know, what, why you were less than somebody else. And actually, 
that's what we want as as applicants we want to know okay so i understand that i'm not as good as paul but why why not mm-hmm. so then i can go away then i can improve then i can get that work experience then i can get that 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 skill level or, or whatever it is that i was lacking that, that skills gap and i think that that's that's the that for me that's a really important part so the lack of work experience is if that's a throwaway comment from a lot of employers, you know, that you're, you know, most employers don't, don't give a first round interview, don't even give feedback. So you don't even get anything. So it's just, you know, you're taking it for granted. It's a lack of work experience. It's a chicken and egg. Cause how do you get work experience? If you don't get the job in the first place, some mm-hmm. key things that you can do there is understand what it is that you lack, then go and work on them. You can do some voluntary work and that sort of stuff as well, which again, uh, you know, I'm sure that you, you, you and the audience know this as well. But you know, for me to be able to gain that work experience, it's, it's, it's about making sure that you're the best fit for the job. And then you can drive um, that skills and you can drive that experience whilst in the job. So I, I would be going back to my first point around research, understand it and impressing that, yeah. that client or that, that sorry, the, the employer with mm-hmm. how much I want to work for that organization. My yeah, desire, no, I, my passion. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think that, that actually deals with a lot of these, um, whether they're fears or whether they're, you know, genuine um, objections that people are getting. You, you know, what you're saying, and I, I do absolutely agree, Lee, is that you can overcome them by, if you've impressed, blown that, you know, interviewer's socks off, um, they'll totally let off any lack of work experience or maybe you haven't got quite the skills because the person I've got in front of me is a really uh, impressive person who we'd love to have in our organisation, Yeah. Totally that. And I think, you know, when you look at certainly at permanent recruitment, so if you're going for full time positions, permanent basis, 80% of successful permanent hires are wrapped around core values, beliefs and behaviours. It's not about any, you know, it's not about that experience piece, you you might end up, you know, it might sound a bit, it might sound a bit callous, but but at the end of the day, you might have a situation whereby you've got, um, uh, where, whereby you've got some people in, in the organisation that uh, needing this type of experience, but you've got somebody that's got the right attitude, the right behavior, the right passion, mm-hmm. which is less experience, and therefore they get hired. So, uh, you know, I, I do think that, and again, that comes on to um, too many applicants, not enough jobs piece as well, is that, is that because employees are, um, employers are not looking at the right elements, or some employers are not looking at the right elements of why I should hire Lee or why I should hire Paul? Yeah. Um, you know, maybe it's just a case of right. You haven't been to this university, so we're going to reject mm-hmm. you. And therefore, there's too many applicants and not enough jobs. But but actually, you've got to be able to stand out as an applicant. And that comes back yeah. down to the CV writing, comes back down to the video interaction. It comes back down to having that knowledge. You know, for yeah. some, as an employer, I employ a lot of people as well um, during, during my times for, for the businesses that I run and now that I own. And for me, it is about attitudes, about, you know, if you can stand out from the crowd, Paul, and actually showcase to me that you're interested in working for me, I'm going to have, I'm going to want to have a conversation with you, you know, regardless yeah. of what your background is. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally, totally agree. Um, just want to say uh, thank you to everyone who's uh, putting their comments and and uh, into the chat, and um, we're getting lots of questions as well. So do keep those coming. As I said, we'll read out uh, the best ones uh, at the uh, towards the end of this webinar. So we're, we're going to move on. Thank you for that. Um, another poll. So hopefully this is um, you know this is this is good from uh, from the audience perspective that, that that you get your say and you can tell us what. Uh, Sorry if I jumped on. There we go. So this is, you know, we're talking about the barriers about getting hired um, and some of the challenges around the recruitment process. Now we just want to switch on to, you know, what sort of jobs are out there and what sort of jobs are going to become in the most demand over the next three to five years. We put some pictures on the screen just to give you a bit of uh, inspiration, but we're going to put some options up. We try to cover all bases, right? There's a long list there. Uh, not sure. So on my screen, I can't view all of it. I'm hoping, yeah. So if, if the if the box is a little bit um, squashed, you can stretch it on your screen. We're asking you to pick two, right? Because there's a lot of options. So pick the top two from this list that you believe will be in the most demand over the next three to five years. I'm really interested to see how this one pans out. Um, Lee, where do your eyes kind of get drawn to? What top two or top one would you suggest? I would say public service. Uh, I think health, uh, I think, is obviously a prominent every front of everybody's mind with the mm. global pandemic as well. Um, so healthcare, medical, every, all, always we're going to need people to be cared for. Um, that is, you know, a given. I can't see that going to 
to, to robots or AI uh, anytime, certainly the, not, not in the next three to five years. It might do in the next maybe 50, um, but certainly not in the next three to five years. So I think healthcare, medical, nursing is, is a... Um, and is Lee, a really, if, I, really if, I could, if I could just cut across you there, would that be possibly, because you've had to visit a hospital this week, uh, mm. you, you were telling me earlier you've managed to injure yourself. So you've, you've had some interaction with the health service this week. I have. This this isn't a wonky tie, by the way, audience. This is a sling because I broke my elbow um, uh, riding my bike on, on Monday. Um, but yeah, I mean, my wife also works for the NHS, right? So uh, I know how hard everybody works in, in that environment. And again, like I say, the public service, the healthcare service um, is, is always going to be needed. So my eyes were drawn to that. I think also you can't get away from software uh, developers. Uh, I think that, you know, in the technology boom that we're, we're now in, that's going to continue to mm. grow. We've talked about robots or AI and computers and automated technology. Um, and that, that is where um, the, you know, the software will come in. So mm. I think that even, even now you're seeing in schools in the curriculum being changed because of the, because of the, the way the nature of the, the, the industry or the sectors have, have been changed as well. But I'm also a firm believer, a lot of my friends, a lot of uh, some of my family, my father-in-law and, you know, lots of my friends are uh, kind of in the trade. So, you know, yep. uh, people always need things being built. People always things being fixed. People mm -hmm. always need things being um, knocked down and rebuilt or mended and, you know, that sort of thing. So carpentry and you know, that, that type of stuff as well. So yep. I know there's, a, I think this will be a broad range. I think this is quite subjective really, but I think there'll yeah, be a broad range. Teachers as well, uh, again, always going to need uh, to be teaching, although parents are now doubling up as teachers, aren't mm. we? Uh, to a certain degree with the whole homeschooling thing that's happening. So, absolutely. And, and again, technology, you know, creeps into that one as well, doesn't it? it? Absolutely does. Yeah, we mentioned, sorry, we mentioned video earlier and we're mentioning it again, you know, it is absolutely going to be crucial in the next, it's, it's now, and, and obviously, obviously COVID has sped that up exponentially, but it is mm -hmm. now shaped the way we are going to interact with our schools, with our teachers, with our healthcare professionals, with our bosses, with our businesses, because yeah. this is what we're doing now, isn't it? We're, we're doing it online. Totally agree. Yes. Yeah, so should we have a look? Let's see. Uh, let's see how the results have, uh, have gone. OK, so actually, there's two real standouts, possibly influenced by our discussion there, Lee. Um, obviously, the percentages don't add up. Don't worry about that because people have cast two votes. But, yeah. you know, medical, healthcare, nursing is uh, is way out in front, you know, but but closely followed by those IT technical jobs and uh, and cybersecurity, arguably that, you know, they're two industries in themselves. But, um, you know, there's a clear, um, a, you know, a clear kind of bias towards those roles. And some of the other ones, um, yeah, software web developer, you'd possibly put that into that sort of IT bracket again. Yeah, um, so I was, I was talking about that software development piece around yeah. that kind of same same thing. So again, yeah. it's, it's, it's an obvious one, isn't it, in terms of that technology side of things. So yeah, yeah I kind of agree, but I can't see any, any below the accounts and finance bookkeepers. So I don't know mm -hmm. what the other subjects were, but it seems like they're the two standout, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we had in there, you know, legal people, engineering, marketing people, trade people, um, and they all got some votes, but uh, yeah, nowhere near as much as, as those two. So thank you for everyone for taking part in that one. We're going to jump straight into the next one if we can. Um, and uh, let me just click on my slides. This might feel like the very same question, but believe me, it's, uh, you know, it's related, but different. So what industry, so there's lots of jobs within every industry, right? Um, but what industry sector do you feel will grow most over these next three to five years? And I reckon that people's answers, people's feelings towards this will have changed hugely. You know, I've put a picture on the on the screen there about holidays and, and leisure and that kind of thing. Well, you know, that's frozen, hasn't it? It's really frozen. Now, does that mean it will see a resurgence over the next few years, you know, when we're unlocked? Who knows? So um, if I can put the, uh, the options up on the screen for everybody, um, if you want to cast your votes, you've got two uh, selections again, please choose your top two. So what have we got? Construction, professional services, uh, that's things like, um, you know, maybe uh, law firms and uh, uh, consultancies and things like this. Manufacturing, IT and communication. Yeah, I think that's exploded this year, uh, 2020. Hospitality, catering, education, transport, um, retail, wholesale, public sector, which includes 
quite a lot. Um, so if you want to put your votes there, Lee, any any sort of standouts? Well, IT, obviously, um, as you said, it's already exploded. IT communication, bringing the world. I mean, the inter internet has already done that years before or gone by. But to actually bring the world closer together, to be able to communicate, to be able to do business, uh, to be able to, um, you know, see friends and family the way mm. that we have been. And now to be able to utilize the technology du during COVID. So I I'm sure that would be number one. Kick, kick myself, I didn't take shares in Zoom now. Well, exactly, exactly that. I'm sure everybody's kicking themselves, isn't it? And, and again, it's, it's a point I was uh, I was going to make before is that sometimes it's about spotting trends, you know, and, and, that, and that's where, you know, it's very difficult to do. You can't, you know, predict the future. Um, but actually, if you can spot that trend and then you can retrain in that industry, then all of a sudden it hits a boom, then, you know, you're going to be you're going to be sought after because it's yeah. supply versus demand, isn't it? I actually think, I don't know why, I've got probably no credibility here in saying this, but I actually think hospitality and catering will bounce back. I actually think it will it will go for a boom. And probably the reason why is because I love to travel. Um, I, that's what I live for with my, with my three girls uh, and my wife. You know, we've got a family of five. Whenever we can, we like to get away. Um, and I'm absolutely chomping at the bit to get away, like yeah. probably most of most of the world, right? Yeah. Change yeah. the scenery rather than your own house. So I actually think that will, I, I think mm -hmm. that will really bounce back once COVID is 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 past us. The vaccine vaccine's gone through. I think hospitality and catering will see a big yeah. boom. Well, and let's. I, um, I was going to. I was just going to say. I think the the businesses that have been been prudent enough to survive and been lucky enough to survive and you know my heart goes out to everybody that's lost their business in that industry during covid but the businesses that have survived i think they're going to see a big boom in the next couple of years in that industry yeah no i think i think you're right there, there will be a resurgence so let's have a look and see what the uh, the results have done uh whoa whoa okay so it communication um i think we'd We'd said that certainly. Um, interesting. The question was kind of three to five years. I think we probably all vote with what's hot right now, and I think that that would absolutely be be the case. You know, public sector. It's a bit of a catch-all. You know, we're talking about you know a lot of jobs there. You know, public sector employs you know a, a huge part of our. Yeah, uh, I forgot about public sector actually. That's going to be that, again. That's always going to be there. I always, think, you know, always, sure. no matter. Yeah, no matter, no matter what. But that is um, yeah, pretty phenomenal. That yeah, IT and communication is uh, is most people's top vote so thank you everybody for that we, we'll, we'll move on in the interest of time so I'm just going to move on my my slide um, I hope everyone's taking some value from the conversation so far um, so this one um, yeah we'll quickly do this poll and then I'd actually like to bring another guest on board in a moment so if I can just put the uh, the options up on screen would you ever consider a complete career change or perhaps you have already done this in in your uh, career to date but would you ever consider a complete career change I mean this could be quite scary for a lot of people Lee yeah, for sure. I mean, I've I've personally done it three times. Um, so I uh, weirdly enough, I just picked it. Um, I actually started off in hospitality. So I, I worked for four years as a catering manager in one of the most prestigious schools in the UK, Harrow School. I'm on Harrow on the Hill, uh, which is in a completely previous life. But then I decided to change my career completely and go into recruitment, mm -hmm. um, which is where I spent most of my career. Um, but obviously, when I won The Apprentice, I changed my career again to go into advertising uh, from, from recruitment. So and then flip back into into recruitment again. So via my own businesses. Yeah. So um, I, I personally would. I, I think that, again, it comes back to the point that I made right at the, the beginning of the webinar, which is if you step outside your comfort zone, you learn and you can only get better experiences. Um, recently, uh, we've appointed um, some new people to our board at Phoenix 51. And instead of just having technology focused people we wanted to get people from different industries to actually come onto our board so that we can actually learn from what their industry is doing and what their sectors are doing differently so we have a, a complete learning so so for me i think it's uh, like you said it's a massive decision but it's yeah. also one that will um develop you as an individual um and probably make you more um attractive for, for probably the wrong word to use but to potential employees as well yeah, well, and, let, and let's uh, so if we can put the results on screen. I think it's um, uh, it's also worth mentioning that. Oh, I mean, there you go. Eighty-eight wow. percent of our audience saying yes, they've either done it or would do it. And I think if you'd have asked that question, um, if you'd have asked that question of our parents' generation, right? You know, um, go back, you know, kind of 20, 30, 40 years. I think 
it could have almost been the reverse because it was it was very much you know you you got into a job and it was a job for life in many ways and uh, why would you change industry because your value goes up the longer you stay in the same job in the same company um, and, uh, and and I think that's changed because um, society's changed and I think technology drives so you know when when a job gets replaced by robotics then we're forced to move or we're forced to adapt aren't we so yeah really sure. I'm not surprised by that actually and that tees up that tees up our, our next guest really, really nicely. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome onto the webinar um, one of Pittman Training's uh, very recent students. Um, so last year, Jane Kelly, if you would like to uh, join us. Um, delighted to uh, have you on board today. Maybe if you can click your camera and come and chat to us. Um, so if you unmute your microphone, then we're good to go. Hi, hey Jane, how are you? I am okay, thanks. See you. Yeah, doing really well. Look, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I know you've had to rush back from, from work. Uh, we will come on to what you do for work. Um, everyone can read, you know, your kind of mini uh, case study on, on our screen there. But um, I, I was so kind of um, com compelled by your story. You know, you, you were in um, that position, right? So you'd spent over 20 years in, in a HR corporate career. So you were doing quite well on a, on a career level. Um, but you decided um, over uh, over time that you know you wanted to change away from that industry, and and uh, you came to Pittman Training for for a bit of support. But if I can hand over to you, kind of what made you change your career, and what steps did you take? Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I was in HR as HR manager for thirty years, so yes, it was a long long time. Um, I think HR has changed drastically over the years, and I loved it absolutely loved it for the first few years and then it just became very stressful um, and I've just been looking around for something different to do and then I actually lost my job so it, it then becomes a you don't have a lot of choice about looking for something and I thought I'm not going back into HR I need to grab this opportunity to do something different um, I did the government um, online questionnaire to look at what would suit me personally. And uh, interesting what Lee said before about working within a organization or an industry that suits you culturally um, mm -hmm. and that aligns with your principles and values. Um, and I realized corporate didn't, with, you know, from a personal point of view, it just didn't suit me. Um, and so I was kind of leaning towards medical, healthcare, welfare, that type of sector. Um, but was very conscious that I am not a nurse. <laughs> I don't like the sight of blood. Um, and I, I love admin. So I tried to combine the two and decided on the uh, medical secretary route. Um, and then started looking around for some qualifications to do. And Pittman's just came out of the blue. Um, obviously knew the name from way back because it's up for you know for years and years. I mean, when I yeah. first started in HR, we always looked for a Pittman qualification for our secretaries yeah. and admin people. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of quite surprised to see um, it was still around, to be honest, which I shouldn't do, I know. <laughs> but to me, it struck me as a reputable name. Um, and the diploma that I did was just, I just felt... You know, even looking at it to start with, mm -hmm. it just looked spot on. So then I went to um, see Alan at the Nantwich Centre, had a chat. Um, he was really helpful, really honest. You know, he said, even though I was going into a new industry and would need to work fairly quickly, I didn't want to go into something that I was going to have to study for two years or something. Um, it's, uh, it just seemed to tick all the boxes and, and that's, it's, it's proven. <laughs> <laughs> no well thank you for giving us some of that uh, you know backstory as well and um so you completed the medical secretary diploma as you as you mentioned and then when you you were telling me recently when you then put yourself forward for interviews that you know that was something you told the the employers about and and they reacted quite pos positively to those qualifications yes definitely uh, <clears throat> and i mean i've noticed from some of the questions that that see the one of my concerns was putting a CV together because it was just going to look full of HR. Um, and I got some really good advice about putting 
um, my experience under functional headings. So it was administration, project management, IT. Good advice. Interpersonal stuff. Um, but <clears throat> obviously going from a first interview, I had no experience whatsoever. And they had to base it on my qualification and my attitude um yeah. and when I got the job <laughs> and they rang me and I was, I was so shocked and they said well you why are you surprised and I said well I've got no experience and um they said well you know the Pittman diploma is is just exactly what we're looking for and obviously the fact that I'd gone out and done it off my own back and and funded it they felt it showed a level of motivation and enthusiasm yeah no, oh, well, look, thank you again. And, and I just want to say, you know, we're, we're really pleased and proud of what you've done and, and what you've gone on to achieve. And to anybody listening in, you know, um, you can do it, you know, in terms of um, grab the ball by the horns. It takes a lot of courage and bravery, but you can change your career if, uh, you know, if you take those those right steps. And I think you've given everybody some really good advice there. Um, so before we move on, I just want to make sure, uh, Lee, do you have any questions before we uh, before we say goodbye to uh, to Jane? Hi, Jane. Uh, no, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, it's uh, fantastic to be able to share their stories. And there's so many uh, people in the chat saying, I'm going through the same thing, you, Jane. Uh, you know, how, how can I how can I look at that? And again, I think touching upon the key point there, which was the 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 sector or the job that has the right or the employer that has the right cultural values. I think for me, that was that's the key standout piece is that sometimes, you know, it's 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 that match at that bit which is the key bit it's not the cv it's not the skill set it's actually do i want to work for this employer and does this employer want me to work because of the key values and behaviors and that's that's the key bit for me i think that's what work yeah. for you jane right i think yes i mean working for the nhs i mean i was it's pure fluke that i started with the nhs on the 23rd of march 2020 so it was straight into covid and i've had nothing but people say to me it's not normally like this. Um, <laughs> but for me, that's been a fantastic experience. I mean, I've just got back this morning. I've been at the vaccine centre, the local vaccine centre, working on reception, checking in the patients. And it's just such amazing experience. Um, and I just have so much respect for the people I'm working with, you know, the doctors, the nurses. There's just a whole feeling. Definitely. And the reception staff and everybody at the GP practice, because they're just all about helping people get better and you know it's just uh you just don't i haven't found that in corporate and it's it just really makes going into work very worthwhile definitely um, fantastic and you, can't, and you can't put a price on that that that's it you know it's a point i was making no, earlier I'm taking a massive drop in salary but i'm really enjoying but you're, but you're happy and, and you're enjoying it and that's the point yeah, yeah exactly that yeah. Well, th Jane, thank you. Thank you so much. We're uh, tight on time, but thank you for joining yeah. us today. And um, you're doing you're doing an amazing thing as well, supporting the, uh, you know, the, the COVID vaccine centers. Oh, so um, thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, look, before we run out of time, thank you again, Jane. We've, we've uh, been gathering questions as we've uh, as we've gone through. So, um, Lee, I'm going to fire some questions at you. I'm going to oh, no. Here we go. I'm going to ask for the you know, the kind of short, succinct answer, if I may. Um, so let's. That's, that's impossible for me, Paul. Uh, let's have a look. So um, here we go. It's a question from uh, Francis Muti, and um, they're asking, "What is the key thing recruiters look for when they're looking at CVs? What is the key thing they look for on a CV?" The key thing they look for on a CV is not your opening gambit because your opening gambit is probably the same as everybody else's. You know, you've mm -hmm. got to start stand out from the crowd. I'm a hardworking, conscientious individual that have you know I, I've seen that thousands and thousands of times. What we want to be able to see on the on the CV um, is your personality. What what is different about you? Um, I think the key thing here, though, is that that's a human, as in a recruiter, but there's also the ATS, the applicant tracking system. So the yeah. computer, the AI, starts to scan the, the, the CVs. And what they're uh, looking for is something different. The computer is looking for the skills. And that's where the, the, the problem comes in. What I would always advise to do, if you've done your research on the business that you're applying for, send in a video of yourself. And I know that's outside your comfort zone. One minute video. Hi, my name is Lee McQueen. This is why I'm interested in your company. This is why I'm interested in that role. These are the skills that I'll bring to the table. I'd love to have a 30 minute chat. And, and I think that will get you through the door than, uh, than posting 30, 40, 50 CVs. 
And related question to that, thank you, Lee. Related question comes in from uh, Michelle Joyce. Michelle's asking, what should you include in your cover letter without repeating what's in the CV? Uh, we haven't really touched on that today. We talked about the CV no, quite fair. a bit. It's what fair. about the cover letter? So the CV, just quickly, the CV needs to be really, really short and concise. You don't have to go into a huge amount of detail. It's bullet points. This is what I've done. This is where I've been. It's almost a record of your experiences. The cover letter should be specific to the reasons why you're applying for that particular role. Key yes. bullet points, again, as to what you are going to bring to that organization. A lot of people fall into the, the, the trap of what they want from the from the role but if you're the employer what you want to see is what you can bring to my business okay paul i'm going to hire you but what are you going to give me i'm going to hire you but what are you going to give me in return that's the bit in the cover letter but again i would go back to video uh, and i know it's unconventional sometimes but uh, over the next uh, you know over months but certainly months and weeks um that's going to change so i would start pushing video into there and start doing the research linking mm -hmm. in with them if you're all on linkedin uh, you, you'll know the employer if you're looking to work for jane jane will be on linkedin you can find jane on linkedin you can connect to jane directly on linkedin you can send jane that video bang there's your personality straight into jane's inbox no yep. no application no cover letter you, you've got to jane and that that's the way to, to and get you, you mentioned um you've mentioned linkedin there and I, I believe in it wholeheartedly. Um, in fact, anybody that's related to Pittman training, we have a, an alumni. So, you know, we're now up to like 10,000 people in our alumni and Brilliant. employers it, it embeds that on your on your LinkedIn bio. So people, oh, you've studied at Pittman training. So do bear that in mind. But would you would you recommend wholeheartedly that people get themselves on LinkedIn and keep it, you know, keep it right up to date? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, on your social media, you know, a lot of people on here will be on Facebook, they'll be on Instagram, they'll be on Twitter, you know, whatever floats your boat. Um, you know, all of a sudden you've got a completely different outlook on your LinkedIn compared to what you've got on your, I don't know, on your Facebook page, for example. So who are you? Are you, are you the LinkedIn person or are you the Facebook person? Because you're still the same person. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I think that we're a little bit naive if we think that employers don't look at your Facebook pages. Obviously, if they're private, then fair enough. But if you've made them public, then people are going to look at your social media pages. What you're posting. You only have to Google Paul Lewis or Lee McQueen, uh, yeah. you know, or whoever else. Go Google yourself. What is your social media saying yeah. about you? What comes up in a Google search? Because you know, yes, it's about references and yes, it's about interviewing. But what what happens if um, you know you, you've you've got your you've got something on your profile that you're not even aware of that mm. actually puts that potential employer off? Let so you again, down. it's about making sure that um, that you're comfortable with what you've got on on the web. Yeah, no, really good point actually. And it's uh, you know uh, maybe a decade ago, certainly twenty years ago, that wouldn't have even been a cool. thing. But it now cool. is, isn't it? Um, yeah. So great questions just come in as well. A uh, person hasn't given their name, but um, let me try and let me try and put this across. So um, if I'm allowed to say this is a Slightly older person, okay. Um, how do you explain a very long absence from the workplace when you no longer have those previous referees? Okay, hadn't thought about that. And how can mm -hmm. you therefore, how can you convince younger people that your age can be an advantage instead of a, a problem? Yeah, so maybe, yeah, yeah, if, sure. you know, if you're a middle-aged person, um, you've still got loads to give, loads of experience, but the person interviewing you is younger and maybe think back to that prejudice piece that we touched on you know lee have you got any thoughts around that how can you explain these huge absences in your in your cv well give, i'll give you i'll give you an example and it might not be the the the, the, the person that's asking the questions example but it might be that you're a returning to work mum for example or a returning to work dad right as it could as it could well be um and you've been out of the uh, the, the the work environment for a while but the skills and the behaviors the competencies the 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 skills that you've learned bringing up two children or three children is, is absolutely vital to the role that you are applying for. So, you know, I talked earlier about the apprentice and Lord Sugar looks at how you're under pressure. He puts you under pressure by trying to sell something in, in half an hour. But mm -hmm. actually what about the pressure of homeschooling three children? Like I, this is a very, this very serious subject for me because yeah. that yeah. is a huge amount of pressure. It's different, but it's huge. How did you cope? How did you work? So for me to, to answer the question, it's about relating back your experiences to that job role and, and and actually showcasing to if it's somebody who's the same age as you or younger than you that's that doesn't make no difference it's about saying these are the skills that i've learned during my time 
on or off, depending on how you want to word it. But this is what I've learned. This is how I've got better over a period of time. You could have been traveling around the world for like three, three years. I mean, I remember I, ne I never went to university. You probably have already worked that out, but I never went to university before. But as a 21 year old, I went traveling and I've done a, a, a round the world trip. And I have to say to you, yeah, it was good fun and this that, and the other, but it really opened my eyes up to different cultures, different values, different behaviors. And it really helped me when I come back to, to, to resonate with people and get jobs and talk to, to, uh, to potential employers on that level. So, so for me, it's about really showcasing, you know, do some, do some homework first. What have you learned during your period of time off? What have you actually done? How have you bettered yourself? What, what differences have you made? And then showcase that to the potential employer that you're applying for. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's great advice. And, and we can see from the, you know, the chat, there's a lot of people who kind of fit into that, you know, that bracket asking a very, very similar question. So um, conscious, uh, conscious on time. So I'm just going to move uh, into the sort of summary now, really. Um, and by the way, if we, uh, you know, if we haven't answered your question, uh, maybe we'll try and do that offline. And um, what I'm about to come on to now is the ways that you can get in touch as well. So uh, it's been great to interact with everybody today. The polls have been good fun. They've been really insightful. Um, you know, we'll be uh, certainly looking at those results again and again. Um, thank you for all your comments on the chat. Thank you for all your questions. We've tried to respond to as many as we can um, directly as well. So uh, do do bear with us. So look, if you think from what Jane has said as well, you know, maybe Pittman, Pittman Training can help me out or, or is there a conversation worth having? Um, just get in touch with us. I'll, I'll put our website on, on the screen in a moment. Um, if you don't know who we are, what we do, I'll try and describe it in about 10 seconds. So we deliver um, job ready skills uh, to people. So training and qualifications that you can put on your CV and put in front of your potential employer. Um, this is done at you know, your pace. It can be done at home or in one of our centers or a combination. Um, and we cover just about every area of work, every career path that you can imagine, whether it's IT, accounting, uh, could be web design, marketing, you name it. Even uh, in Jane's case, medical secretary um, diploma. So, uh, so that, that is uh, the kind of things that we do. Um, and we've got locations all over the UK, Ireland and further afield as well. So jump on our website and you can see where your local training center is. And my, you know, advice there is book a career consultation because um, we don't, you know, it doesn't cost anything. There's no kind of obligation there. And our career, um, advisors are there to talk to you about where is it you're trying to get to you know where because you might think oh I need to do an IT course to go and get a job but actually there might be a different way or it might not be IT that um, is, is is the industry that you you really want to get into so come and talk to our career um, advisors and we can uh, we can book an appointment for you um, I just want to say at this point as well huge thanks again to uh, Jane Kelly for joining us today um, thank you in a, in a huge way to uh, Lee thank you for giving us your time today lee really do appreciate Delighted. it thanks for having me no our, our pleasure and if you want to check out you know lee's uh, uh companies you've got the raw raw talent academy and the uh, phoenix 51 so i'm sure google will pop those up without any trouble um i noticed on our call we've got lots of people from the uk so you can see our website uh, on the top right hand corner if you're dialing in from ireland we have a, uh, a related website so um ie and if uh, if you're dialing in from kenya i noticed there are about 50 or 60 people joining us from uh, from kenya which is wonderful so you'll see our website on the screen there um, but look I hope that Lee's advice and the advice from today has um, you know struck a chord with you about how to approach the CV um, how uh, I guess video comes into the equation as well so step outside your comfort zone and do embrace video because that's uh, only going to become more and more prevalent talked a bit about LinkedIn as well maybe trying to um, take a different approach to all the other applicants a um, little bit about the uh, CV and, and and the covering letter so I think that was you know great advice be confident put across your personality Lee any final thoughts before we go um, no, I think you've just covered it off again, Paul, brilliantly. Uh, like all, all I would say is, look, if you if you don't try, you'll never know. So, you know, step outside your comfort zone and, and give it a go. Like they can only say no. If you, if you, if you approach somebody on LinkedIn to, uh, you know, and you, and you strike a chord with them and you don't go through the a normal application process, the worst case scenario is that they say no, but they know who you are. 
that that and that's better than knowing you on a bit of paper there's no empathy with a bit of paper there's no empathy with a cv because it's just a name on a, a on a bit of paper but actually a video makes you a real person a phone call a conversation something that you know it makes you real and that's different that's then all of a sudden you get feedback. I'll give you one top tip in the end. This is my last one. And it sounds really, really basic, but it works. Whenever you go into a retail outlet or a supermarket or whatever it might be, most people wear a name tag, okay? They wear a name tag for a reason. Use it. Use the name tag and you watch the level of service that goes up from the basis of you. Oh, hi, Paul. I wonder if you could help me. Could you tell me where the can of beans are? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, Paul's your best friend. Oh, he used my name. But everybody wears them. Seldom do we use the name. Use the name, create a bond, create a relationship, and it, and, uh, and it will give you a better service. And it's the same instance. If you can create a bond, create a relationship with a potential employer, you've got more chance of at least getting feedback or at least getting your foot in the door. Great advice. Thank you again, Lee. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you to everybody that's, um, you know, survived the last uh, hour. We've run slightly over, but there were so many questions, so many things we wanted to get through. Um, as I mentioned, we have recorded today's um, webinar and uh, we'll be sharing that with all of you um, via a thank you email. So uh, check your inbox uh, either uh, tomorrow or uh, over the weekend. We'll be sending you a thank you email for being part of today. And if you want to get in touch, all the details will be contained within that email. So, um, um, look, enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week. And um, thank you and goodbye, everybody.